and future developments of EOSC by giving uh, feedback uh, during consultation will happen just happen now and uh, the core documents and uh, sharing uh, best practices. Let's have a look on the fourth focus area of, Liber, uh, of the Libre Roadmap, uh, metrics and rewards. If we want open science to thrive, we have to change the traditional methods of assessing the outputs of scientific research. So to measure the merits of research and not near the influence of the journals, which kind of action can we take? Libraries should, of course, help by participating in the development and implementation of open scholarly metrics. We can, for example, embrace San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, DORA, or the Leiden Manifesto. We can collaborate in the development of next generation metrics, focusing on evidence-based quantitative and qualitative indicators. Uh, in Libre, we did uh, we have a metrics uh, working group, and they did a report, which you can find also on the Libre webpage. Then, with funders on the human resource, we can develop new methods of assessing and rewarding researchers. Very, very important uh, by using open science career assessment matrix, or it's called OSCAM. You can find it also on the web. Very interesting um, and uh, something that is. Uh, I think uh, basics, um, if you want to really to, um, to develop these new methods of uh, assessment. But we may also take care to retain high standards, ethically and technically. I think all of you who um, try to um, implement um, these new metrics and uh, have um, know this, it's not always very easy, it's a challenge to retain the high standard um, reporting these metrics uh, for indi individual researchers. The fifth focus area of the Libre Roadmap is about open science skills. For open science to become the de facto mode of conducting research and scholarship in Europe, researchers need disciplinary specific skills and broad cross-disciplinary capabilities. That's a lot. So what can we do uh, for this focus area? Research libraries should play a key role in training students and researchers. Um, to implement this in your library, you can, for example, with other partners, provide a multidisciplinary one-shop uh, one-stop shop for researchers to support open science uh, workflow. You can also incorporate open science skills in academic training for students. You can provide innovative digital uh, training materials and courses to support skills uh, development. So I think lots of us progress quickly in fact during COVID-19 crisis. Um, we all learn to do this online conferences, I think. Uh, as librarians are already experts in metadata, we may build and develop further our expertise uh, in fields like persistent identifiers and ontologies uh, to be able to support optimal open science infrastructure. The sixth focus area of the Libre Map is about research integrity. Lots of information are circulating every day on the web, and unfortunately, there are also lots of false information. Alas, a continued public trust in science is fundamental to secure support to publicly funded research but also uh, it's a basis um, uh, for democracy. Libraries have a key role to play in supporting research integrity. Uh, we can participate in establishing codes of conduct for research integrity, integrating openness, transparency, accountability. And we can train researchers about legal and ethical aspects of uh, scholarly communication. 
copyright data management in the context of uh, open science also. And of course, provide services um, to counter malpractices as uh, plagiarism and fraud. Last but not least, the seventh focus area of the Libre Roadmap is citizen science. Citizen science is very important in establishing links between science and society. It is therefore necessary that research libraries assist and lead citizen science projects. What can we do in this field? We can promote the library as an active partner and should promote uh, as an active partner in citizen science. We can promote good conduct in citizen science as we also do the promotion um, about the research integrity. We can apply that also to citizen science. Um, we can uh, develop a guidelines, um, methodologies and policies for citizen science. And of course, we can develop skills to be a strong and active partner um, in citizen science. For example, in science communication, in information technology, or simply through a project management, in fact, because uh, uh, sometimes we uh, we don't care. Uh, we are so used to to uh, to be project managers that we we forget about the fact that we are very uh, knowledgeable about project management. And uh, it's very important to have this project management in the field, um, in, this, uh, in this field of citizen science. So you see uh, that libraries have many roles to play. These are some of the most liberal for uh, libraries, especially research libraries. And today we want to hear from you. Uh, what is your vision of the future uh, role of libraries? Which challenges can we solve? Uh, that is what we want uh, to go into uh, with you with this uh, discussion uh, series. So thanks for your attention. I'm now giving the floor to Rachel Frick, Executive Director of uh, Research uh, Library Partnership uh, at OCLC. Thanks, Jeanette. You can just, I want to say that was a really great presentation. Um, um, waiting, there we go. Now I have control on the slides. That's one thing I think all of us has learned a little bit more about how we do uh, online presentations. And I wanted to thank all the folks at Lieber and Jeanette and everyone for making this experience possible. As Astrid said earlier, we had originally envisioned doing this in March in person. And um, now we're here in September doing it online. So thank you for your time today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the OCLC uh, research enterprise the Research Library Partnership, and then digging into what OCLC has been doing to support open scholarship and open content for libraries and the library's investment into open. I love this quote from the Lever um, report that a revolution is required, one that opens up our research processes. And in thinking about this, um, really focusing on you know, where in the landscape and in this larger environment of, of supporting scholarship and research, where an organization like OCLC helping with our networks like Lieber can focus and respond to the innovations in scholarly communication, changes in user services and their expectations, and basic research infrastructure. I think it was highlighted there in the um, Roadmap, where are those key pieces in the infrastructure that libraries really have a role to play? And thinking about not how we contribute individually, but as a network. So that it ties directly to what we call our mission at OCLC Research to scale um, and accelerate learning, innovation, and collaboration. And we do this through a number of different venues and uh, programs. 
We have our general research division that investigates key areas for libraries. And it's devoted exclusively to the challenge facing our libraries and archives worldwide. We partner with what we call our elected delegates in the OCLC Regional and Global Councils. This is a venue for these regional views to impact the global services at OCLC. And then we have our programs like the Research Library Partnership that I lead and Web Junction, which really focuses on our public libraries to be that engagement layer to scale those in, um, conversations. So we move our findings from research into operational practice in a, in a knowledgeable, iterative way. So a good example of this is that we've been working with our global council over the last four years to identify key questions or um, environmental impacts that libraries can contribute to. Most recently, we've been investigating the UN's um, strategic um, development goals and where libraries play a part there. But back in 2018, we decided to focus on a question on open content. We developed quite a robust survey that um, tended to cross a lot of divisional silos. And um, we had a, quite a great response to the survey. We had over 700 responses from 82 countries to um, two questions that asked about libraries' investment in open, whether it was the creation of open content, the collection of open content, um, services around discovery and access, as well as preservation. And this was quite a large set of data that took us a while to synthesize as we move through it. We just recently um, published a report here called uh, Same Directions, Different Trajectories, and it focused on the data set within this larger data set from the survey from our research in university libraries. Over 97% of the respondents were highly involved in open content activities and the majority were overwhelmingly stepping up their activities and planning new ones. There was an increase, we, there was a projected increase from anywhere from 8, 10 to 18% around all open content activities and the future growth areas were specifically around research data management and fair data as well as interactions with collections as data. But to keep in mind, this survey was done pre-COVID and we have definitely gotten new information through another research effort being led by Lynn Silipini Conway on how open content and the reliance on reliable open content has increased during this, um, the last nine months. Digging into this report a little bit more, you can see that the top areas for research libraries in regard to support to open content were focused around discoverability and access, reliable um, access of open content, and then also the standard, standardization of metadata in relationship to open content for those findable and accessible resources. And then the third popular or uh, reported investment of open activities for libraries started to um, be different dependent on the regional areas. So for example, in the US, a lot of open activities centered around special collections and archives. In the UK, research data management tended to be the, uh, the next top important priority. And in Canada, um, also around special collections. But we also saw in more in the European responses, uh, activities around uh, what we would call CRIS systems or research information management systems. So what OCLC did from these survey results is bring those back into our organization and think about what does this mean for us as a global library service provider? You know, what additional research do we need to invest in who, what kind of partnerships do we need to build between other like-minded organizations, um, uh, content producing organizations, and how can we best serve libraries at that net scale? So back in 2018, we've been having these large conversations across our organization 
with our community engagement programs like our Global Council, like programs like Research Library Partnership, and through our regional councils to really think about open in regards to access, to collection and the content, you know, how do we support data, education, et cetera. So really taking into consideration this industry-wide shift to open and what does it mean for libraries and what does it mean for an organization like OCLC and how we support that. So for us as an organization, we had to define what it meant for us at OCLC when we say open. And so we took a very broad definition and for us to apply our lens as we examine our services and our engagement and our activities. And we definitely said it was digital. It was stuff that was accessible immediately and online with really no technical barrier that was freely available. There was no authorization or cost barrier. And finally, around rights, you know, were those rights clearly defined in a way so people understand immediately how they could access and use the particular item they were looking at. So this has informed what we call our open content commitment, that OCLC will privilege our open content to deliver on our mission. We want to increase access to the diverse environment of open content. We want to integrate open content into our services and our programs. We want to support our libraries and our library-driven open of content. And then we have dedicated a team for um, thinking about the universe of open and where it intersects with OCLC and the larger library community. So as you may guess, you know, we have been working with a number of publishers to make sure that their open content is readily identified in our resources for libraries. So, for example, we have a growing list of, you know, what I would say the usual suspects here and really working with um, identifying their metadata so that their indicators that these um, resources are open are clearly uh, recognized in systems. But we've also, as a result of COVID-19, we are maintaining a growing list freely available content from these partners specifically as a result of the pandemic. The resources updated regularly, and right now I think we have over 80 collections, open collections that have been um, opened up as a result of the pandemic. And I think one of my colleagues will um, bump in on a link to that resource. In addition to uh, traditional publishers, We've been working with um, a number of different OA directories, like the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAB, Hadi Trust. Um, we are pulling in collections from Europeana and Internet Archive. And we're also working with Unpaywall to basically um, make sure that when some, someone clicks on a link for an open resource, it resolves to a trusted open um, version of that resource. So you're not going into a 404 or in thinking about trusting that reliable open content, we want to work to make sure that the user experience going into open is not confusing, very clear, and that libraries are continued to be seen as a trusted venue for these resources. We also provide um, a number of, through our digital collections gateway, access to a number of institutional repositories. So it's not only you know, traditional content coming from our publishers, but open content being published by our libraries that's available through um, institutional repositories and other aggregation points. So what does this look like? I mean, so I like to say this is how it shows up in worldcat.org, which is OCLC's open resource. So here you can actually, we now have a um, search that you can just click on open access materials. All this information we're getting from our publishers is in feeding into this, including the COVID-19 resources. And so once again, we're trying to improve the user experience around open. So helping people discover and access those resources that libraries have invested in through the creation of open content are readily available at that point of need. This is just one example. We're also including all this information in other 
products and services from OCLC from our um, resource sharing services to our integrated library services like WMS. The other thing that's very important and open, once again, we're gathering all this data from publishers, from uh, content providers, but at the end of the day, um, it comes down to the data that describes those resources and the indicators of the openness or the degrees of openness that comes with the description of those particular assets. And um, for those folks <laughs> that know me, it comes down to the data, which sometimes is a very, very dry and uh, uh, geeky concept to work through. But um, in the last couple years, we've been working with the German National Library and developing a proposal to the MARC editorial board to consistently, in a machine actionable way, describe if a resource is open or not. So there is a de designator, I think it's dollar sign seven, in the 856 field of MARC that now has been officially um, uh, accepted into the MARC standard to, is, as a zero or a one if something is open or closed. This is amazing because as we think about all of those records and all of the metadata coming from these content providers, being able to express open in a machine actionable way will have a big impact on our discovery system. Currently, this MARC adaptation is available for new catalog records being created going forward. We're currently looking at how to retrospectively um, enhance those records for past cataloged resources. There's a lot more information about this on our website at OCLC slash open. Um, for more information, that link will be available to you later on in the presentation. But this is a big, when we were examining open and open content um, and the infrastructure to support open scholarship, communicating how help is, how the rights involved with um, reuse is problematic. And that tends to be a critical sticky point in thinking about how we communicate around these open resources. So it's not just updating uh, descriptive standards like MARC, but it's also how we identify what is a thing around persistent IDs, et cetera, and so forth. So there is a lot of work to be done for libraries around the data that describes our open assets in order for this grand vision of an open scholarship universe to actually um, come into being. So to that end, OCLC is working with a number of organizations from SPARC and North America and SPARC Europe, IIIF, ORCID, DataSight, CORE, and others to think about how we partner together, how we um, work together not only in thinking about what points of research do we need to investigate going forward, what type of technical standards do we need to work on, what type of operational workflows need to be re-envisioned, and pulling together the community so we can have a common vision and a common goal. It's not necessarily that we're all in the same boat going together in sync all the time, but it's having a same point in the horizon that we can all um, shoot for. So we're working with organizations around national and regional bibliographic infrastructure to identify those key points and work together. And in those conversations, we've identified a number of areas for continued exploration. These include, of course, linked data prototyping and open data, which we're doing a considerable amount of work funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. We're investigating pulling in more open educational resources and open textbooks. This is in a Definitely those efforts have ramped up in the last six months in response to COVID-19. We're looking at the publishing of open content and more about library publishing initiatives and how that content, if it's not coming from these traditional publication workflows, how are they coming into our finding systems and actively seeking those pools of data out. And then more importantly, not more importantly, lastly, um, working with the curation of open content because there is so much and how do we um, ha 
continuing to maintain a trusted user experience around open, but also the preservation of open content. Not too long ago, there was an article about um, the disappearance of hundreds of open journals from the web and how the Internet Archive is tr working to maintain access to those resources. So having a deeper conversation about the preservation of open content is something that we're looking forward to having with you in the community. So those are just some of the topics that we've been working on at OCLC and thinking about open and where our role is and who we work with. And this is something that I'm excited about this partnership with Lieber to really investigate what are those research questions? What more do we need to know? Where in the infrastructure and in our operational workflows we need to improve or change as far as things like data around our open assets or how we collect them? And what things do we need to know about ourselves in order to support this revolutionary um, progression around open scholarship and open science? For more information about what um, some of the initiatives I talked about today and more activity that OCLC is planning, you can go to the link there on the screen, oc.lc slash open. That's where you'll find um, the most recent activities. And of course, at the top of the presentation, our most recent report focusing on open content in libraries is available free to all and uh, for download today. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to our moderators. Thank you very much. So I will do the question and answer session. Um, and I think, Rene, are you, you have the poll. I think I've got it now. Great. Okay. Q&A. So thank you, Rachel, um, for sharing OCLC's perspective on open content. Um, and so it's now time to open the floor for questions. And we have some great questions already. Uh, so let's uh, go immediately for it. Um, so there's first, uh, there are a few questions on skills that I would like just to bring together. Uh, there's one from A.V. Tramansa um, about, uh, thank you very much for this very useful uh, discussion or presentation, great initiatives. I wanted to comment on the word skills in your slides on open science skills. So that is to Jeanette. Uh, I wonder why information literacy term is not used. Libraries have strong programs of information literature, literacy. Uh, why not add the open science agenda in the information literacy curriculum? That was the question from Evi. And at the same time, there's also a question from Mana Samantha, who says how lifelong learning is connected and associated with citizen science, that's citizen science. Let's keep citizen science for the moment outside, just skills first. Jeanette. Okay, ah, skills. Uh, of course, libraries continue, especially research libraries, continue to teach uh, information literacy, uh, and this is absolutely essential. Um, in our strategy, uh, we pointed on, on uh, the challenge is, in fact, to go further. That's why it doesn't appear in the list, not because it's suppressed. It's, uh, it's a, a basis, but we have to go further. We must also make materials readable for machines, especially with uh, data, as uh, we have to describe data. Data is, uh, in the this, uh, metadata for, uh, to describe data is, uh, is a huge challenge because normally our uh, people are um have plenty of work just doing the things they do uh, for publication and to describe data is a is a major problem um because it's such a, a huge field so we know that um, we have to make things machine read uh, readable means we have to teach the robots uh, information literacy <laughs> uh, to be able uh, to to go further 
So yes, we can insert uh, because in your question I saw that uh, you asked um, uh, we can, uh, because of the curricula. Yes, we can insert it to the uh, information uh, which is curricula, uh, but it must extend to, at some point to to artificial intelligence also. That is one of the um, the points uh, that. Uh, we work upon with European Open Science Cloud, or here also at Science Suisse, uh, we have a, a partner project uh, called Connectom, for example, which uh, in the elaboration and, uh, of metadata will heavily rely on uh, artificial intelligence. Hope this uh, can uh, answer your question. So information literacy skill is uh, central and should be ex extended <laughs> to and artificial so, intelligences. So, Jeanette, um, and then following up on what you just said about, you know, artificial intelligence and that we need also to have a machine actionable um, uh, programs and so forth, um, there is also a question from Chiongi uh, Caraxoni who is also asking about skills and saying, I wonder if there is focus on the training of librarians in open science aspects on the undergraduate level. So either as a general overview or as a specialization, is there a recommendation sharing of best practices among schools? And data or survey on the effects of open science on library structure departments? Oh, I don't see the, the connection. Um, is uh, OS training for undergraduates uh, uh, was the first question? Yeah, training, um, training of, uh, of librarians when, when, at, at, the, at the undergraduate level. Shouldn't we already start at that level to, uh, to train librarians with open science principles and um, uh, share best practices among uh, library schools? across countries yes, probably. We, I think we should absolutely do that. And normally um, now we have people in the library schools who are um, digital natives. And uh, you may see that uh, in fact, uh, often at some point uh, when teaching them about e-resources, you may um, gradually interest them uh, in, uh, in the publication process and in the open science publication process, of course. Um, as they are digital natives, I often uh, hear that they are, uh, they have their own um, online publication. So, um, of course, we should um, take that, we should encourage that so that from the beginning they are interested in the whole um, electronic publication process and they just um, learn to do that on their own for the things they are first interested in on their own. Many of them like the idea to publish their, uh, their own uh, publication, their own journals. I would like to go to the following question, if you don't mind, because there are quite a few and it would be nice to have done a few. If we can't answer all the questions, we can still follow up by email or in our blog post. Um, but um, Timo Borst has a question. Uh, besides OA and open data, I think both open source software and open educational resources, OER, to be important focus areas, just like openness and open research as a general attitude and disposition. Maybe I can give the question to Rachel. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, when we were doing the, the open content survey for Global Council, um, we had a lot of questions around support for open infrastructure and open educational resources. So thinking about um, the library's investment in open, whether it's from content creation, open scholarship, 
to participation in open standards or tools like the um, IIIS, and I'm going to forget what the three I's and the F stands for, but that's an image, international image standard that's really important for sharing images across different types of, of um, digital content platform providers. So scholars can um, compare images no matter what kind of a repository those are being housed in. So, and then of course, open educational resources and open textbooks that is becoming more and more um, important in thinking about how we gather this information together. So the question was around general openness and libraries um, investment in open as a mindset. And um, I think it's really important to think about Open isn't free, and open needs to involve um, all of our partners in the ecosystem and, and data and information provisioning. Um, and thinking about, although um, a platform's code might, be op might not be open, being able to move resources from platform to platform is important. So really thinking about, open as a mindset, not in terms of um, uh, what we like to say, black or white. It's not really a binary situation. It is a definitely, it's a gradation across quite a continuum. But I think the common goal here is to lower the barriers to knowledge, increase um, the equity and access to scholarship and research. So our societies can be better as a whole, um, so we can function at top efficiency and innovation. And how we piece these parts together, it's, it's a combination of transparency, willingness to work together, building trust, and a lot of that comes to, um, yes, upholding certain values and standards and common goals. So it's, not really a degree of, I don't want to say, I'm trying to get my best point across, maybe I need another cup of coffee, but um, really thinking about this in, in multiple directions and, and pulling in, in the fact that this is a, a community effort. Did I answer the question? <laughs> you won't know. <laughs> I'm going to the next question. <laughs> So, and that will be the last question that I can uh, put forward here. It's from Philippe Conzet, um, and I think it's to both of you, uh, Jeanette and Rachel. It's the Libre Open Science Roadmap is very informative and ambitious. One dimension I think in particular, smaller research libraries may miss in how to get started with all this. Yeah, um, so I may uh, answer from the point of view of uh, Bibliothèque Cantonale Universitaire de, de Lausanne, which I am the director. Uh, we are the biggest uh, library in Switzerland, but I'm sure many of you will be judge of uh, much bigger libraries because Switzerland is so small. <laughs> it's quite easy to be the biggest library in Switzerland. Um, for Bessie Lausanne, for example, it's not easy uh, to go into all these uh, fields. Um, uh, we can't have uh, specialists for everything inside uh, the library. And uh, for example, um, we years ago, we decided um, not to be a, an infrastructure provider because we it's, uh, it's too heavy for us. So we put everything in the cloud and we take everything from the cloud. It's, uh, so it's much uh, easier. So uh, for a small library, I think, uh, just um, first thing is to have the right priorities. Don't go into the heavy field. Um, infrastructures, uh, just take the central infrastructures that will, are provided, for example, in Europe, European Open Science Cloud. Um, you take this and, and you, you are able, uh, even if you are a small library, to connect directly 
to this kind of uh, central infrastructure and also to have uh, training directly from this platform. Um, if you need training, uh, you can also uh, have a visit to the Libre website. We have plenty of webinars um, provided on all this, uh, this subject. So uh, this is the, the wonderful point with the, the, the World Wide Web. They are, uh, you are able, as a small actor, to directly connect, in fact, to extremely powerful infrastructure and training. And I would just follow on to that, is that that's what makes programs like this one between OCLC and Libre, I think, really exciting in examining. Um, the open science framework and, and the roadmap, and that even though you're a, you might be a small institution, I, I found that really great ideas and creative um, challenges, you know, it, it, when we come together and work on these problems uh, or challenges collaboratively, you're not having to, to do the full lift yourself. It's connecting with really great partners in order for all of us to move forward. And I feel like everybody has um, a talent or an idea or a perspective to contribute that will make us all better. So I, and I would encourage people at smaller institutions, instead of looking at this big, large thing and think about how can I interact with those, it's like who, who do I partner with? Where are those um, communities that I belong to that we can come together collaboratively and think about this as a community. So. Thank you, Rachel and Jeanette. So this is the end of the Q&A. Um, and I would like to uh, thank you so much for participating in this event that is co-hosted by Oliver and the OCLC Research Lab Partnership. So to all the attendees, um, you will receive a message from us after this with uh, a link or more links, several links, one to the recording of the session um, and uh, to the slides and also to a blog post, which we will write to report back on it and in which we will also add the questions and some answers to it. Um, we are looking forward to welcoming you to the small uh, discussion group discussions, which will take place in the coming weeks. Um, they are sold out. All registrations are closed now. There was one question in the chat if um, you can still join as an observer, but um, that is, uh, I think that that is something that we have not included because we want to have these really meaningful conversations in small groups. And so if you feel that you have observers around who don't really participate, it's a different type of uh, discussion and conversation that you can have then. So um, this is the way we've chosen to do. This is the format. So that's the way we will go forward. Um, but um, you can register, and I do encourage you to register for the closing session because we will report back on all these discussion group, group discussion sessions and present all the outcomes. So that will be interesting and there will be again, um, and we might extend the question and answer uh, session then so that people have more opportunity to, uh, to have to put forward their questions. So I encourage you to join our at, at the last session on 5 November. I would like to thank Jeanette and Rachel for their inspiring uh, presentations. And I would like to thank you all for joining and participating. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ditya. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.